All right, welcome everybody to today's Modern Mentor presentation, Tricks of the Trade for Live Fire Training. We are joined today by Sean Gray from Cobb County Fire and Emergency Services. The webinar today will include a comprehensive discussion on the NFPA 14th standard 1403 standard on live fire training as well as the ULFSRI study of the fire service training environment, safety, fidelity, and exposure. A little bit about Sean. Sean currently holds the rank of fire captain with Cobb County Fire and Emergency Services in Metro Atlanta and has been a fire in the fire service since 1993. He has a bachelor's degree in fire safety engineering and is currently working on his master's degree at the Naval Postgraduate School. He has been a member of multiple technical panels involving firefighter safety research and is appointed as appointed member of the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute Advisory Board. Sean is an NFPA committee member for firehouse and fire service training facilities. Recently co-authored a Penwell Publications DVD and book titled The Evolving Fireground. He has also been published in multiple fire service magazines, is an FDIC hot lead instructor, runs the web stop, website StopBelievingStartKnowing.com and delivers evidence-based tactics training courses across the U.S. Thank you, Sean, for joining us today. The stage is now yours. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie, for having me. And uh, hey, everyone that's here, uh, thank you guys for being part of this. It's going to be short and sweet, but uh, we're going to go through. It's based off of a little blog post that I wrote for ISFSI. And uh, it's really just kind of a lot of stuff that we got from our experience and kind of le lessons learned um, as we went into the training fire study with UL. Uh, we started trying a whole bunch of things. So um, the really our goal for live fire training should be to try to create event limited environment because Today's modern fire ground, that's the type of fires that we're fighting fires in today. It's going to be vent limited. So how do we get our wood-based legacy fuel fire to become vent limited? And uh, that's where things start to get a little tricky. So you got to get creative. So the first thing is whatever facility you're working in, try to get it as tight as possible. Uh, it needs to be as airtight as you can. Um, and even, you know, a lot of times they're large, big open rooms and then you just got to put pallets in the corner maybe and reduce the size of those rooms. Um, that seemed to help in the past where we've put up uh, facade walls and then reduce the size of the container. That way we can control the actual fuel and, uh, and the fire itself to give a more realistic environment. So keep it as tight as possible and then let the container fit, fit it for your needs. Uh, something else that we had to do at our facility because uh, in Cobb County, Georgia, it's so old and so leaky that uh, we, we have smoke curtains or smoke blockades. Uh, we use them on all of our ladder trucks. And uh, we, of course, have them down at training to train with. So uh, some pretty clever guys down at training got smart and decided to use, rather than keeping the, the smoke out of stairwells, they, they decided to keep the smoke inside the building. And uh, they work great. So the smoke curtains work really, really well. Um, if there was an emergency, they're on outward swinging windows. And the curtain, you just go right through it. So. Um, it's not like we're breaking any rules with 1403 or anything like that. Um, let's move on to fire behavior training. So one of the biggest things about getting into live fire training is you really need to understand the fire behavior. And uh, what is your current, what's your department currently providing is the key. So, you know, a lot of departments out there are just barely given to anybody a couple of hours with an IFSTA PowerPoint and just kind of clicking past it. And um, that's something that we've really tried to focus on in Cobb County. It's currently three days um, for our recruits. So we take them through a crawl, walk, run method. And we, uh, the very first day we do give them the IFSTA PowerPoints because that's what they'll be tested on, followed up by a lab. And when I say lab, we, we basically burn candles and uh, just show them the fire triangle, take the air away, take the fuel away, show them what uh, conduction convection radiation can do. Um, it's a small little lab experiments that you can just do with a glass and candles. And then moving on from there, we take it up to the small scale and we use a dollhouse. So the next step is take them outside, show them what flow path looks like, show them what smoke looks like, volume, velocity, density, and color using the dollhouse and uh, 
for those that are out there who haven't burned a dollhouse in the past and you want to get the build plans, you can go to our website, stopbelievingstartknowing.com. They're right on there. It's a, it's a free download, PDF downloadable document right on there. Just click on dollhouse build plans. Uh, and then we take it up to full scale. So for in our recruit school, the very first day that they are in air packs in live fire is with us in fire behavior. We take them inside the building and uh, we get into several, several different evolutions where they're not really asked to perform any tasks. They're more inside of a live fire environment and they're just observing the, the fire container in there. And then we do take it one step further um, where we actually take and put them into a, uh, what is known as a flash over simulator or drag or phase one container system. And uh, we put them in there and, and teach them about door control, um, really try to control the air and keep it as tight as possible and just educate them on rollover. Really, you know, it's called a flashover simulator, I think, because the manufacturers like the fancy name of flashover, but uh, it's not truly a flashover in there. We're not trying to uh, get any flames or anybody melted in there. We want to try to show them what it looks like pre-flashover and when there's any concerns with that. So let's get into looking at how to use artificial smoke. So our goal, like I said earlier, is, is vent limited fires, right? So vent, what's vent limited versus fuel limited? So vent limited means that we're gonna try to take the, uh, the fire down. When we take the air away from it, we'll see the fire react. When we get it air, we should see the fire react to that and it should start to take off. Many times our training fires are just fuel limited fires, meaning that they're just burning the legacy fuels that are in there and uh, we have to keep adding fuel to it in order to keep it going. Well, the problem with that is we don't get a very realistic smoke out of that. And uh, it just continues to get hotter and hotter and the building just gets warmer and warmer and warmer and then all of the instructor's gear ends up getting saturated. But you gotta keep it tight, and like I said, use smoke blockades. Sorry, I'm clicking the wrong way here. All right, so artificial smoke. Uh, artificial smoke works great, especially if you, have, if you do have a leaky building and you're not able to create a vent limited fire and you're working with fuel limited fires, you can use artificial smoke. So it's not really um, something to obscure the vision of the trainee, but it's more to, we built a hallway outside of our fire room and just normal 36 inch wide hallway. And uh, we take those students in there, back them up, put them wall to wall or put their SCBAs against the wall and they face each other. And we have them turn on their flashlights. Then we put a smoke machine at the front entrance door. So opposite of the fire room at the front entrance door. Remember fire travels from high pressure to low pressure. So when we have that open, that there is gonna be air coming in the door. So there's an air track coming in the bottom and it's, we can't see that air track typically. So what we do with this, this artificial smoke is we actually use that as a visual indicator to show the flow path. So you got the smoke coming in the front door and it's being sucked towards the fire. Have them turn on their flashlights and the, you can see the smoke in front of your light and it'll be cruising past there at a pretty good speed, especially if you have a decent fire inside the fire room. And then we close the front door and everything will stop. Or we close the fire room door, everything stops. We open it up back and forth just to show them that every single time you make an adjustment to the ventilation opening, you're going to see the fire or air get pulled in by the fire. And again, just using that artificial smoke to show that. So it's a very good uh, way to, uh, to show flow path and try to explain it. So fuel type options. Uh, so this is, we're going to get into the ULFSRI training fire study here. If you're not familiar with that study, just Google it, ULFSRI training fire study. It should come right up. There's a full report. And, uh, and as Jamie, she used all the big words earlier, but it's the study of the fire service training environment, safety, fidelity, and exposure study. And um, really what they wanted to do is uh, see what people across the US are doing with their live fire training. So there's everything from pallets to hay or Excelsior, OSB, and then I got pine mulch down there at the bottom. So let's start with pallets. Pallets is probably the most commonly used wood uh, in, in any fire training structure. So a lot of people are using pallets. So pallets work great. It just it typically is a fuel limited fire and uh, it doesn't do exactly what we want it to do as far as trying to create a real good environment. But a lot of times that's what people, it's all they know and uh, they're not really willing to look elsewhere or they can't get their training chiefs or people above them to think outside the box and try different type fuels. So using hay or Excelsior. So in reference to 1403, hay is hay or straw is actually 
cannot be used in 1403, per 1403. If you read the standard, hay and straw cannot be used. And when I say it can't be used, it, it can be used if it's pesticide free. And for anybody that's out there listening, I don't know if you've ever tried to look for pesticide free hay or straw, it's nearly impossible to find it. So um, we haven't been able to find it here in Georgia. Now Excelsior is, is something different. It's, a, uh, it's wood shavings. It kind of looks like a, a, a thing of hay. Uh, it works great, but it's really expensive. So um, just depends on your, uh, your budget, I guess. If you're uh, really wanting to try to follow the rules, I can tell you that we're still using hay in Cobb County and many places around the country are still using hay. But um, you know, there's an exposure risk there with the pesticides. So always make sure you're wearing your SCBA. So OSB. Um, OSB has uh, it's gotten um, some critics out there against it, saying that it's uh, causing cancer and it's really bad. You can't burn it. It's technically not a wood-based product. So again, I refer you to 1403. Read the standard. It does not say in there that you cannot use OSB. It says wood-based products. OSB is a wood-based product. Does it have glue in it? Absolutely. It's a press board, but it's still a wood-based product. Many wood products out there are, are, do have some type of glue in them. Even plywood has glue in it. So the argument against OSB, um, there's several studies that are out there that, that uh, you can Google and find and um, that, uh, that will show you benefits of both. You know, one study is going to say OSB is the devil, and then the other one says, oh, it's not so bad. So I think you just have to weigh it and uh, make the decision on your own. So pine mulch, what is that? So when we were uh, starting with the UL training fire study, um, we started messing around with some alternative fuels in our building. And uh, just one of the guys, you know, we're in Georgia, we got lots of pine mulch, trees fall down all the time and they get ground up and we can get as much pine mulch as we want. And uh, so we went and got a ton of pine mulch and started filling barrels and just making smoke barrels with pine mulch. And uh, it actually worked very, very well. It was an awesome smoke, really thick, um, great obscuring uh, abilities. And uh, it worked really, really well until I had a conversation with Dan Matrikowski about it. And I sent him some photos of it. And he's like, wow, that smoke's amazing. Um, but then he said, did you consider the creosote? And, no, I'm a fireman. I don't, I don't know anything about the creosote buildup from pine mulch, from burning pine mulch. So apparently that's a bad thing. So after we had been burning it for uh, oh, a couple of weeks or so, we did start to see that there was a buildup inside the tower um, of some creosote. And uh, so we just went ahead and pressure washed it and stopped using pine mulch. But um, I, you know, I'm not sure that the, it's a, the worst thing ever because if you're ever seen inside of a flashover simulator, there's all kinds of buildup in there from the OSB. So you just kind of got to weigh it out. But um, pine mulch is an option and I can tell you it gives you really good smoke. So I mentioned smoke barrels and uh, with smoke barrels, that's an interesting thing. So depends on how you want to define it. Looking again in the 1403 standard, smoke barrels is not live fire training. It's a smoke barrel. Live fire training is, is flames and pallets stacked in. A smoke barrel is just filled full of hay. And, uh, and we have a, a way that we, we stack them with wet hay and then just try to keep a bunch of air poked down in with a stick. Um, we have a hole at the bottom and we take a blower that we've altered the cord of the blower. We put a, a dimmer switch on the blower so that we can slow down the air going in. Just a little electric blower, 20 bucks, you can buy them at Home Depot. And we blow air into that. So that barrel will just pump out thick, nasty smoke. Um, and that's, that technique has been used at the Georgia Smoke Diver Program for years now. And it's, it's very, uh, very effective for getting a very good smoke, uh, smoked up building. So I, uh, you know, give that a, a try. So geometry of fuels. A lot of people just take pallets and they just start stacking them in there. So when you stack them in horizontally and just flat on top of each other, that's the easiest way to get in and actually start burning them. However, it doesn't really give you a very good flame propagation and it just builds up a lot of energy and heat inside of those burn rooms. So try using a TP shaped and then maybe even stuff, it, stuff them with hay and uh, so you can get some flame propagation up there. What we found in the UL uh, fire training study was that really the geometry of fuels is significant. You need to put your fuels in a correct way. And if you can, you know, just mess around with it when you think of like, what's he talking about with the geometry? So just 
hold a card over top of a lighter and light that and see what happens. It's not going to catch on fire right away, but if you turn it so that it's vertical, that thing's going to catch fire and take off. So um, just think about that the way that you're stacking your fuels and uh, you'll get a better flame propagation, especially if you put it up in a corner, you'll be able to get flame propagation across the ceiling. So and that's where we get into hanging fuels. So hanging fuels, if you think about a flashover simulator or a phase one dragger simulator, the hanging fuels is typically OSB. So you can still hang fuels inside of your burn rooms. I mean, you know, it's there, why not use it? So that's uh, something we've done at some of our uh, acquired structure burns and uh, some of our live fire training across the country that we go do at uh, large fire conferences like FDIC. We try to get our fuels up on the ceiling and to make sure that we're hanging them. So we get OSB up top and uh, even hung up high up on the walls. And that, uh, that gives us a very good fuel package, get a good flame propagation across the ceiling, um, very good smoke uh, with the OSB because the OSB will start to pyrolyze and give you a very, very nice smoke. And OSB is the closest thing that we can get to a real environment uh, with, a, with the heat release rate that we're looking for. And the problem with pallets is the heat release rate is very slow because of the density of the wood. And uh, OSB has got a lighter density, so it works a lot better with the heat release rate. If you remember that, if you've never used OSB before and you want to start using it, um, it's going to give you a significantly higher heat release rate, so be ready for it. So know your standards and research results. I think I've I mentioned that several times. And uh, 1403 itself is not a huge document. I think it's only 36 pages or something like that. Um, but you can go through and dig through it. I know that some of the significant changes in the 2018 update are uh, instructor certifications, firefighter one, or sorry, fire instructor one and fire instructor two. So to be the lead instructor, you're supposed to be fire instructor two per NFPA 1041 standards. And uh, that's that was something that we had to uh, get everybody trained up on. We didn't have people that were all instructor twos. So we had to facilitate some courses in order to meet the standard. Um, also, some of the, the things that come up as far as wood and things that you can't burn, you cannot burn, cannot burn pressure treated wood, rubber, plastic, polyurethane foam, tar paper, upholstered furniture, carpeting, chemically treated or pesticide treated straw or hay, all shall not be used as part of the fuel load. So there's your straw or hay piece in there. Um, if you want to go ahead and read that, that's 4.13.2 in the NFPA standard. And then as far as the ULFSRI study, uh, that's an important one. You know, go in and look at that. Uh, it's got all of the results down there. So not only did we, we didn't just start in one type of building. We did everything you can think of. So we did acquired structures. We did, uh, we've measured smoke obscuration, uh, smoke obscuration of live fire training in the fuel packages. So just basically looking at the density of the smoke. Uh, measured L-shaped containers or L-shaped training pops just to see how realistic an L-shaped training pop was. We also measured concrete building props. Um, and uh, that's pretty common place for, uh, for people to do concrete live fire training buildings. And so we did tons of measurements in there. So you got, I mean, there's like five different reports just on this training fire study. So if you're uh, in the training division and you want to try to do things right, I would uh, follow this report very closely. I think you're going to see that you can get dangerous fire loads in the structure with whatever you use, with whatever type of fuel that you use. So that's why I warn you with the heat release rate of OSB. You need to be careful using it, um, but you can safely use it. All right, let me uh, check my notes, make sure I'm going over some stuff here, Jamie. All right, so let's talk about the geometry of the fuel again. I want to mention that one more time. So with our barrels, when we talk about geometry of fuel, we take barrels and we cut U-shapes out of them, and then we stack a pallet inside that barrel. We cut the pallets into thirds, and then we put two pallets. It cuts down the density of the fuel, and we stack them inside all of the barrels in order to get it going. So that's our fuel package. Rather than taking and stacking uh, pallets up or put them in a TP shape, we actually use a barrel. So we put that in the corner and then we have OSB on the walls and OSB on the ceilings around it. It's the exact same configuration you would see in a flashover simulator, but we do that in acquired structures 
Um, we've done it in concrete buildings. We've, we've done it in other metal container buildings. And uh, you just got to figure out ways to get everything hung up. We've used uh, lag screws uh, into the concrete. And, uh, and then we just make some holes in the wood and just hang it up there. And all you got to do is just pull it off. So um, once it's burned up, you pull it off and throw it out and make it repeatable. You know, a lot of people continue their fire and they just keep stacking it on there. You want the student to learn and see the fire the same time. Each student should see it the exact same set, exact same scenario each time. Just like a flashover simulator. You only use one set of wood for a flashover simulator. It burns up and then you reset all the fuels. Same thing for any kind of other live fire training that you're doing. If you're trying to get them to focus on the actual fire, it just, you know, depends on your your objective because we're doing live fire for search, for fire attack, for all these other pieces. And uh, we may not necessarily need a really good fire behavior in there. So you can kind of alter your fuel packages dependent upon what you're doing. All right, Jamie, you got any questions? Thank you, Sean. Um, if anybody has any questions for Sean, um, you can go ahead and put them in the comment box now. Um, and they'll be addressed. Am I going to see those like in a chat or something? Or are you going to see them? I'll see them. I'll okay. You know. Okay. Uh, Just realized my little microphone wasn't down. <laughs> um, while we're waiting for some to come through, um, Sean, why don't you address um, which type of nozzles and flow rates? that you're using during your live fire training events? Yeah, so um, we posted up some pictures on, uh, on Facebook of the nozzles that we use for live fire training up on uh, Stop Believe and Start Knowing on Facebook. It stirred up quite a controversy um, because we use 20 GPM nozzles. So people were out there just losing their minds. So let's be clear, the 20 GPM nozzle is there for the student. We give them that nozzle so that they can open the bale all the way. That's what we want to train firefighters to do is open the bale so they get a full flow. The nozzle reactor is not going to quite be there, but they still get a decent stream out of it. These are TFT Metro nozzles, and uh, they're flanked down to be 20 GPM nozzles. So you still get a, a, a decent flow, and it knocks back the fire. So you're actually putting water onto a training fire rather than saying, again, whoa, whoa, don't put my fire out. You can flow water with a 20 GPM nozzle. Now, we're fully compliant we have an instructor right there next to them with a 150 GPM nozzle, somebody who's trained and knows exactly what to do if things get bad. And, and my argument to people who think that the 20 GPM nozzle is crazy, well, would you rather just put that 150 GPM nozzle in the, in the hands of a student who may or may not know what they're doing and then don't flow water when things get bad? You know, I'd rather tell them to open it all the way and give them, give them good technique and then have a trained guy right there ready to knock back the fire if we need to with 150 GPM nozzle. Sean, do you have any pictures of your setups of the live fire setups or fuel setups that you can share? I do. You want me to do you think I can do that right now on here? Um, yeah. I'll share, I'll share my screen, right? Is it doing it? Yeah. You can do that, and okay. if you have right, them available, you can email them to me, and I can post them with the link that's going to be shared on the website. Okay. Yeah, they're in the article that's on the blog, but um, here's a picture of what our barrels look like, the U-shaped barrel with our pallets cut in. So you can kind of take that, and then it's recording, right, so it'll show that? It, yeah. All right, Then uh, I think this is a top side photo of the barrel again. Yep, so you can see how many pallets we got in there. It's usually two to two and a half pallets. The pieces kind of fall apart, and we uh, stuff it stuff it in as much as we can. Here's a picture of us hanging fuels in a can. So we try to make sure that everything gets tight up top, but uh, this is us trying to be using chains to get the fuels and everything pushed up. And then we're, we're in there as we're reloading. Everybody's wearing masks, trying to be as safe as we can. And then this is pine mulch. So if people want to see what that looks like, that's what the smoke looks like for pine mulch. And uh, you can see it's pretty good. You got a pretty good air track there in that window. And uh, 
I liked the pine mulch. Obviously, the creosote is a downfall, but uh, I really liked it. It gave up a, a, some good smoke. All right, I think that is all for the photos. Okay. Um, let's see, there was one more. How many sheets of OSB do you use in your phase one container and where do you place them? Yep, six, six sheets total. Um, we got uh, two on the top, uh, two on the sides, and then really they're kind of half sheets in the back. So um, I guess it's technically five sheets, but it's cut into six. So let me say that again, one on each side, two on the top, half sheets in the back. So it's technically five sheets total. And then with the barrel cut in the way that you guys saw the photos there a minute ago. Do you have a metal burn building and how do you keep the smoke in? Yes, so we have a metal burn building and we keep the smoke in. Uh, we try to keep it in with those smoke curtains um, that are out there. There's uh, two commercial available. There's one made by Tempest and another one made by, I uh, can't think of the other company, but it's uh, the Tempest is called a Tempest Path Master. So if somebody want to look those up, but they're they're made by the same person is it the um, smoke um, blockade? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it's a smoke. Yep, smoke blockade, and uh, they were invented by Dr. Reck from Germany. Mm -hmm. And um, but they work great for live fire training. They also work very well. Uh, we use them in uh, multi-story building fires. We just found as a department that we weren't very efficient in trying to pressurize stairwells. We don't get enough, you know, large building fires like FDNY and that kind of thing. So we're better at trying to keep the smoke in and forcing it out of the fire compartment. Um, so we decided that uh, we just want to keep the stairwells as clean as possible. That's where the smoke blockades come in. Um, let's see. What is the total number of pallets um, that you it, use per package? Depends on how good you are with your cuts. Uh, some of the guys can can get three, uh, but we, it's usually two to two and a half. Uh, can you state the blog name again? Yeah, the blog, it's on isfsi.org, and uh, it's Tricks of the Trade for Live Fire Training. We'll, I'll share a link. I'll put a link with that to when we post the webinar on the page as well, so we'll have a direct link to write to it. Okay. Yeah, it has everything in there that I've talked about today. Um, and just to verify, using OSB is not going against NFPA 1403? It's not pull it up look at it see if you can uh, pull up nfpa 1403 and go through it I, I actually have it up on a on another computer here and um it's not does not go against it at all i've read through it multiple times because um we've we use osb a lot and uh that um that's where the the fallacies and fears and facts of 1403 come in um the challenge with 1403 is that it looks like a legal document and firemen don't like reading that. That's just, that's the reality of it. We don't really like reading that stuff, right? So if I hand a guy at the, the kitchen table and say, hey, here you go, read over 1403, he's going to fall asleep in the first two sentences, first two pages. Um, so it's not a friendly, readable document. It's a, almost like a legal document. But training officers who may have something against OSB or have heard bad things about OSB, they'll say, oh, well, 1403 doesn't allow it. I challenge you to take 1403 and show me in 1403 where it says you cannot use OSB because it doesn't say it anywhere. Um, and if it does, email it to me. Tell me what number it is and uh, we'll look it up. But yeah, it doesn't say that in, in the 2018 version of 1403. It's just one of those rumors that's out there. Um. And speak, what are your concerns about carcinogen exposure? So, you know, I mean, obviously that's the concern with OSB, right? Is the, is the concern of carcinogenics and, oh, it has the glues. And like I mentioned earlier, well, so does plywood, lots of things, you know, are, are you, what kind of pallets are you burning? You know, most people are just getting cheap pallets, free pallets from wherever, and they have all kinds of stuff on them, oil and paint, all kinds of things. And we don't say anything about that. So 
if you're going to be somebody who's really going to start calling out, hey, what's, what about the bad stuff in OSB? Well, then you got to buy clean pallets. And um, the only department that I've ever seen buying clean pallets is LA County Fire Department. And uh, they, uh, they have a much larger budget than uh, probably 95% of the fire departments in the nation. So uh, they, they're able to spend a little money on, on very good stuff. So uh, the concerns with OSB is, is definitely the exposure concern, right? Um, but you know, we should be, when we're doing live fire training, we should be always on air and fully encapsulated so that there should not be a concern from the cancer piece. However, if you wanna look at some reports, there are several out there and uh, I'll give you the names of them. Uh, the first one is called Understanding Airborne Contaminants Produced by Different Fuel Packages During Training Fires. And this one is, is uh, doctored by uh, Kenny Fent. He works for the CDC at NIOSH. He also worked on the UL Cancer Cardiac Study with firefighters. So he's very knowledgeable on what we do. And uh, the guy's an industrial, he's got Dr. Kenny Fent, I should say. He's a PhD, he's an industrial hygienist. Um, and he's up to date on everything. So there are measurable PADHs and VOCs in the air when you use OSB, but there's also the same thing happens with using other fuels. And I think if I look at the abstract of this report, um, it says these results suggest usage of SCVA by both instructors and firefighters is essential during training fires to reduce potential inhalation exposure. Efforts should be taken to clean skin and clothing as soon as possible after live fire training to limit dermal absorption as well. So if you're doing, if you got a decon policy for uh, post-structure fire, you should probably do the same thing for training fires. Then there's a, a HEGIS report. It's H-E-G-G-I-E-S. And that HEGIS report um, will, has some stuff that's a European study. I think it came from New South Wales and that was done in 2007. And they had some results that said OSB is not very good and, and we should really try to use something else. But then there's another report out there that's called the Lee Enterprises Consulting Report. And it uh, says combustion products from Oriented Strand Board. And it'll tell you where they compared it to uh, plywood. And it says the main conclusion is that the most important toxic components are the same for wood and OSB. And that OSB presents at most a minor increase in risk. So those reports are out there. If you're trying to battle against the people who hate OSB, um, they're there and uh, you just got to educate yourself so you can go back at them with facts and uh, rather than talking about rumors. Now, I will say there is one more thing about fake smoke. A lot of people, uh, when they're using artificial smoke, they'll think, oh, it's, it's just fake smoke. I don't need to wear a, a mask. You do. There's a report out there, again, that Kenny Fent doctored and uh, it's called Evaluation of Chemical Exposures During Firefighter Training Exercises Involving, involving Smoke Simulant. Just Google smoke simulant PDF. And uh, they found that there's a significant chemical exposure to using the fake smoke. So we really should uh, try to pay attention to that as well and, and wear your breathing apparatus in fake smoke. I think we had a few more that come in. Um, okay. what are, what's your thought on water sources for fixed facility? One hydrant or two? Uh, I would refer you to the 1403 document, exactly what it says, and I got it right here. Stand by, we'll pull it up, I'll tell you exactly what it says, water supply. <laughs> it says each hose line and backup line shall be capable of delivering a minimum of 95 GPMs, a minimum reserve of additional water in the amount of 50% of the fire flow demand, determined in accordance with 4.12.1 which is basically, hey, how much water do we need if something gets out of control in here? Um, and uh, says, except under separate water sources shall be utilized for the supply of attack lines and backup lines in order to prelude, preclude the loss of both water supply sources at the same time. So um, a single water source shall be sufficient at a training center facility where the water system has been engineered to provide adequate volume for the evolutions conducted and a backup source or backup pumps or both are in place. So you should have two sources of water, but you could have one engine hooked up to a hydrant with on tank water, and that's your attack engine. And then your backup line 
is 500 gallons sitting in your backup pumper. You don't have to have two hydrants. And Sean, while you're looking at the standard, I believe earlier in the discussion, yep. you said that hay and straw are not recommended, but I'm guessing if you had to use them, which one would be better? Uh, well, they're technically supposed to be pesticide free, um, pesticide, non-pesticide treated hay or straw. And uh, so I challenge you to try to find that. I, I haven't been able to find it. So uh, Excelsior is ideal. If your department can afford to buy Excelsior, it's E-X-C-E-L-S-I-O-R, uh, I would buy Excelsior because it's wood shavings. It tends to, uh, it, it works great. Excelsior is awesome. Um, it, it burns great, but uh, yeah, hay or straw is supposed to be per NFPA 4.13.2 says right here, <laughs> it must be pesticide treated stray, straw or hay shall not be used. Um, and all the links for these reports, can you send them to me and we'll um, have them yeah. added to the um, page where we host where we post the webinar I've got lots of questions yep. about yeah. where those links are I, yeah I'll uh, I'll send it to you as soon as we get off here I got all they're all at this actually PDFs okay do you, want, do you want them in PDF or do you want them in links um if either either or I'm okay. just gonna put them on there as additional resources okay yeah no I'm happy to happy to share it um, let's see, I've got another one. Is OSB considered pressure treated wood? NFPA 4.13.2 prohibits pressure treated wood. Yeah, so the way that I read the pressure treated wood, because OSB is, is a pressed board, I don't see pressure treated wood is the wood that we use outside for decking and things like that. It actually has a chemical in it to preserve it, where OSB is not, it's just a press board. So it depends on how you want to define the, the term pressure, I guess. Let's see, that looks like we've got it for the questions, unless anybody else has any more questions for Sean. And I see everybody's comments about the reports. Like I said, we'll have those posted on the <laughs> website for you. Um, Sorry, so grab I them right my that. On that. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't, you know, one of our goals when we go out and do this stuff is that um, we don't want to be able to not have any answer, right? So we've done the homework. Um, so we, if somebody's going to call us on something, it's not going to, we're never going to give them the answer. Well, because I said so, you know, that's, that's terrible. So we want to, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we give people the right, right information. Sure. All right. Well, that looks like looks like it. I haven't gotten any more come through, so um, I think we might be good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, if you have any other questions or comments, um, you don't hesitate to get in touch with us or with Sean. Um, Sean, you yeah, want to give you your wanna... information? Yeah, might. Sure, you can give my email. You want to put my email address on there? It's um, pretty easy. It's ff ff sean gray at gmail dot com. Firefighter sean gray at gmail dot com. Perfect. Um, and then I'd like to add, if anybody um, has a suggestion for a future modern mentor webinar topic, um, I encourage you to email us. Um, you can email me, jamie.lorello, and that's J-A-M-I-E dot Lorello, L-O-R-E-L-L-O at I-S-F-S-I dot org. Um, and there is a link on our website if you go to the Modern Mentor webinar page where you can submit a proposal as well. Thank you again, Sean, and everybody else You're who welcome. has taken the time out of their day to join us. Yep, Jamie, oh. I'm sending you those reports right now as we speak. Sean, hold on. I have yeah, okay. I have a couple more questions. <laughs> okay, that's all right. I'm good with that. <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for decamp decontamination after training burns? Yeah, so um, there's a ton of stuff out there on that. Um, 
it really should try to follow the stuff that, that people have been doing for the fire ground. But uh, we, uh, we, when we come out of the, of the container, uh, we have people completely wash off their gear. So we have a decon line set up and uh, you know, especially if they're um, have been overhauling the container and that kind of stuff, they, they get scrubbed um, dependent upon exactly how much material they have on them. Uh, but we, uh, we would consider everybody getting washed down. Um, as soon as they get out of their gear, we bag it up, we send it to the extractor. So people, we have two sets of gear. I know we're fortunate with that. And then we also, most of the guys that are doing a lot of live fire training actually have three sets of gear. And we uh, give everybody a, a wipe and uh, we use fire wipes and uh, wipe down. And then um, they, we have a locker room before we leave. And uh, a lot of guys go in and um, scrub themselves with Dawn dish soap. If you've ever tried that, Dawn dish soap seems to work the best. You can scrub yourself head to toe with Dawn dish soap and uh, it usually takes the smell out of your skin and out of the hair. Uh, we also are using the uh, particulate hoods. Our, our entire department got issued particulate hoods. So that, that tends to help with the, the smell as well. Well, that, that kind of answered the second part of his questions. He said, what are your procedures? <laughs> <laughs> well, good. And we actually, you can look up if you, um, I can give you a resource. If you look up uh, Cobb Fire Training on Vimeo, we actually have uh, some videos on there on Decon. And there's a ton of Decon videos out there, but we have one where we show scrubbing our SCBAs, which we do uh, on truck days on Monday. We clean all our SCBAs, um, and then we have people coming out and getting washed off. And then we, at that time when the video was shot, we had a hood exchange. So our battalion chief vehicles had a bunch of hoods. We still do the hood exchange, and it's it's just one it's one for one. Um, but we weren't using the uh, particulate hoods then, but now we have particulate hoods. Sean, would you mind sharing your a copy of the SOG or SOP for decon after a fire? No, yeah, I can. I'll uh, I'll share that too, and we pull that up and send that to you as well. Yeah, I think that we can probably just link. If you don't mind sharing with the membership, we can link in the resource library on the website and just pull a link to that. Yeah. No, absolutely. I have it on PDF. All right. Well, do we have any more questions for Sean? They keep trickling in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everybody's just saying thank you. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you for taking the time. Mm -hmm. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye, everybody. All right,